Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Friday, October the 23rd. Uh, regretfully, I've got to tell you that we have nine additional deaths since Wednesday. Uh, our 414th death is a 77-year-old male from Upshur County. Our 415th death is a 77-year-old male from Marshall County. Our 416th death, a 95-year-old female from Greenbrier County. Our 417th death, a 73-year-old male, I'm sorry, female from Hancock County. Our 418th death, an 80-year-old male from Brook County. Our 419th death, a 73-year-old male from Putnam County. Our 420th death, a 95-year-old male from Putnam County. Our 421st death, an 83-year-old male from Putnam County. And our 426th death, a 95-year-old female from Brook County. Now, you'll hear more about this as we go forward today, because Dr. Marsh will tell you about age groups and all that, and he's much more briefed and better than I. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that of these nine additional deaths, the youngest of them all was a 73-year-old female from Hancock County. They ranged in from 77 to 80 to 83 to 95, 95, and 95. We have got to be super, super cautious as we enter the fall and temperatures, you know, get a little colder and a lot colder and we're more and more and more restricted as far as outside stuff and that makes it even tougher. Biggest thing is just this. I know how I feel and how difficult it is to read these names or read these deaths to you. But at the same time, it's only a fraction, I'm sure, of how these families feel and how absolutely their friends, all the people they know feel. These people, with the youngest being a 73-year-old and then the oldest three 95-year-olds, Think of the wisdom and what they gave us in West Virginia. And now they're gone. So please don't let them just go down as a st statistic. We've got to remember these are great West Virginians, and please keep them in your prayers, your thoughts every day. Um, we had 335 new positive cases in the last 24 hours, and that's a lot. Our positivity rate is 3.85. It's too high. Our cumulative percent you know, positive is now at 2.86. Our active cases are at 4,602, and our recovered cases are 16,368. Our hospitalized you know, patients now have eked up just a little bit to 193. And our effective reproduction number is at 1.05, which is higher than we want it to be for sure because we want it to be under 1. It's at 1.05, but listen to this. It's the 12th best in the United States. What does it tell us? It tells us, simple as mud, that this terrible killer is still with us and spreading across our land, all across the United States. And West Virginia is not exempt in everything because we are the oldest and we are the most chronic, uh, highest in chronic, chronic illnesses. So with all that being said, we've got to be double, triple, sure, and, and, and absolutely looking after one another and concerned and absolutely staying on top of this. We can't just shut down, but at the same time, we absolutely have to stay on top of it and keep on trying even though we're tired. Now, we have one red county, we have seven orange counties, Berkeley, Doddridge, Braxton, Wayne, Boone, Mingo, and Monroe counties. 
We're offering our free testing as we've done. It's up on our website. It's all over the place. So the orange and the red counties, you know, will continue to be tested. And, and I encourage all, all of our residents to come out and take advantage of this free testing. Please, please come and get tested. It's so, so important. From the standpoint of Walgreens and Frith Pharmacies, they, they continue to do drive-through testing and, and, and God bless them and thank you so much for all the help that you've given us because it's really, it's really, you know, a testimony to people stepping up and thank you so much. From our school outbreaks, we've had, we have 21 now. We have 72 confirmed cases in the public schools. Um, just to tell it like it is, this is a fraction, just a, an absolute fraction. And, uh, and we're really, really happy that the number is this low. It continues to be this low. There's a lot of good work being done by all the administrative people, our teachers, the service personnel, in looking after our kids and looking after yourselves. Please continue to do so any kind of ish situation we, we, that we would have, you know, we're ready to run to the fire. The guard is right with us and all the DHHR and all the local health departments, everyone. So we're gonna to continue to stay on top of this, but you've done a lot of good work, West Virginia. As of today, there are 45 outbreaks in our long-term care facilities. There's 14 outbreaks in our churches in 12 counties. I always read these counties because it's really important that if you're in one of these counties, you've got to really watch. That's just all there is to it. But Doddridge, Fayette, Mason, Mercer, Monroe, Nicholas, Putnam, Upshur, Wayne, Wetzel, Wood, and Wyoming counties. If you elect to go to church, which I think is absolutely the mainstay of our lives, I get it, but just wear your mask, keep a pew in between, social distance, wash your hands. Absolutely, if you happen to be one of the elderly, and, and I know, you know that church is so important to you, but you may want to just take my words and think about them and take my advice and maybe just skip a few you know, sermons and everything, and with all that, maybe try to pick up you know, some online stuff. If not, you know, you know, talk to, to all the you know, your, your church members and everything by phone and whatever, but it may just be smart money to just, uh, just try to stay away and, and just take care. Please just take care of yourselves. We have 13 active inmate cases. We're down to seven staff cases and corrections. The flu vaccines are going, continue to go on. Please take advantage of that. As far as our counties and our cities, we're up to almost 161 million that's gone out. We continue to take the applications. We continue to send the money out. We want to continue to do that, so please continue to apply. From the standpoint of CARES money, it's gone out for our public utilities and everything. Like I said, it took a while working through all the, the hoops to get this all positioned, but you know, I thank uh, Chairwoman you know, Charlotte Lane and and the PSC and all the stuff, good work that they're doing. Uh, I thank all those that are, that are connected to this and this effort. But the bottom line is if you have a utility bill, electricity, water, sewer bill, and everything from March to July 31st, from March 1 to July 31st, if you will absolutely apply, you know, it may very well be that that lingering terrible bill gets eradicated because we just allocated $25 million to take care of that. That will help our utilities, but it will help West Virginians that are having a really, really tough go of it. So please apply and we'll try to get that taken care of and, uh, and, and get you back in good shape and, and, and everything be okay. Uh, from the standpoint, we, we now have 17 million 301,804 dollars that have been uh, awarded to West Virginia and, and for, therefore the victims of crime and, uh, and it's a victim assistant grants, you know, to 84 public and private and, and, and non, private nonprofit agencies throughout West Virginia. 
We need to help these victims in every way in, in regard to any kind of level of violent crime. You know, with the COVID problems, we've seen a rise in, 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 in the number of West Virginians using our nonprofit agencies for assistance. That's why they desperately need this funding, and that's why I'm proud to get it to them today. These funds will provide direct services such as counseling, personal advocacy, court advocacy, client transportation and support services to victims of crimes, including domestic violence, sexual violence, child abuse, and elderly abuse. And I want to especially thank our Department of Justice and the Trump administration for helping us and sending us these dollars. And it's, uh, it, you know, these dollars will be greatly appreciated and absolutely in, from a necessity standpoint used and used in a really proper way. So good news, $17,301,000 is coming to West Virginia or is already here and will be going out from us. And, uh, and, and so good news and, uh, and again, West Virginia, just please just continue to, to watch after yourselves and be concerned, but don't be afraid. And uh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there and everything. We're closer and closer to a vaccine. We all know that, but we've still got a ways to go. And we've still got a ways to continue to reach out our hands and help one another. So that's all I've got today. All right. Thank you, Governor. First today, we'll go to Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Good afternoon. I had to check to see if it was morning or afternoon. Um, I, I want to um, underscore um, what the governor has, um, has said. So when we look at the demographics, the age groups that we are seeing positive tests um, in the state of West Virginia over the last seven days, uh, perhaps as recent as two to three weeks ago, we would have seen most of those positive tests in the in the 10 to 29 year old groups. So, so we saw an overrepresentation in those groups. Now we see a much more even distribution uh, when we look at positive tests, positive COVID tests over the last seven days. And what we find is the highest group, which is not statistically different, but importantly, the highest group that we see over the last seven days is, are in people over 70 years old. And we know this is a group of people that not only have a much higher risk of dying with COVID-19, but also have a much higher risk to get severely ill, to end up in the hospital, to end up in the ICU, to end up on a ventilator. And when we look around the country, we are also seeing the number of cases is picking up dramatically. We had uh, yesterday 71,000 uh, positive cases in the, in the United States, which is a three-month high. We have the average positive uh, testing going up uh, over a two-month high, and we have 41,000 people around the country in the hospital, which is the highest uh, in about uh, four to six weeks. When we look at, at the pressure on hospitals, we've, we talked initially about the surge and flattening the curve. Well, it's important to note that certain states like Wisconsin have not only opened additional beds, field hospitals, I think in their state fairground, but they've started to put patients in those beds yesterday. So this is a time, as, uh, as has been suggested, when we are seeing COVID start to become much, uh, spread much more easily. The governor told us that despite West Virginia having an RT value or reproduction score of 1.05, we have one of the lowest in the country, and that means that COVID is spreading everywhere. And as we look at our testing, we know that our testing is a real cornerstone of identifying those people who can spread to others in that asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic time. So it is so important that all of our citizens go get tested. We have free testing. We've opened up that opportunity, and that is a really good way that you can make sure that you are protected, but also that you're protecting others, people that you love. It's also been, um, been projected by the University of Washington group that if people wear masks consistently, we will save 100,000 lives uh, by the end of the year. So ultimately, as the governor said, it is in our power 
to protect ourselves and protect each other. We see COVID spreading everywhere, including in West Virginia. Our reproductive number says it's starting to spread more. And it is really time, as we've said repeatedly, repeatedly for each person in our state to make a renewed commitment to do the things that can protect them and protect each other. And that is really the way that we are going to get through the next six to 12 weeks, which many people project is going to be the worst part of the virus that we've seen. And I'm not saying that to scare people, but I want people to be aware that whatever we do today is going to really be felt in a couple of weeks from now and in, in, a, in a month or so from now. So today and right now is the time, West Virginia, to be doubly committed to doing the right thing, to mitigate, to get tested, to wear your mask, to stay physically distanced. And the CDC just came out with new guidelines that said it wasn't just a continuous exposure to somebody sitting six feet or less away from you for 15 minutes. It's a cumulative exposure. It's a little exposure here, a little exposure there. And, and the CDC talked about a prison guard that came into contact with six inmates in another state and got COVID-19. And they were being tested, so it wasn't known they had COVID. So COVID can infect us in very small doses, which is why it's so important for all of us to wear masks, stay physically distanced, and particularly as the weather gets colder, avoid crowds, be really cautious of indoor places where people have their masks off, and that is restaurants, bars, coffee shops, gyms. And it doesn't mean you can't go there, but be very, very cautious when you do and stay six feet or more away from other people. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Dr. Marsh. Next, we'll go to Christina Mullins, the commissioner of DHHR's Bureau for Behavioral Health. Good afternoon, everyone. When it comes to slowing the spread of COVID-19, disease investigation and contact tracing are some of our most valuable public health tools and are established ways to prevent the spread of infectious disease. In August and September, local health departments, the National Guard, and DHHR began utilizing a modern cloud-based data system to investigate cases and monitor contacts for symptoms. There are currently over 400 active users in this system performing case investigation and or contact tracing related activities. In addition, DHHR maintains a list of trained individuals, including students, volunteers, and DHHR staff that can be called upon if communities experience a surge in cases. But all of us can help these efforts in a couple of ways. If you test positive, please respond to the contact tracers, provide accurate information, and isolate yourself from others. The information that you provide will be kept confidential. The second thing that you can do is answer the phone. If you see a call from your local health department, or your caller ID says West Virginia COVID-19 response, or you see the telephone number 866-611-0661, you may be a close contact of someone who tested positive. Contact tracing is a critical activity in protecting the lives and safety of our citizens, and you can help West Virginia remain strong throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Next to Major General Hoyer with the West Virginia National Guard. Good afternoon. Uh, next three days for the Guard is going to be a significant balancing act. We have uh, a number of our units doing their military training over the next three days. We continue to stay focused on supporting uh, contact tracing, the testing, and the sanitization missions. On Saturday, we have 160 Guardsmen from the 157th Military Police Unit who are coming back from their nine month deployment at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we have Special Operations Detachment Europe with 22 personnel now back at Fort Bragg who are demobilizing from their deployment to the Middle East. So a significant uh, effort going on, a lot of families sacrificing. As the governor, uh, Dr. Marsh pointed out, uh, I would ask on behalf of all those individuals, their families, all the folks that are out there busting it hard from a guard and our partner uh, state agencies, Please wear a mask. Please get tested. Please participate in the contact tracing to help us mitigate this spread so that those folks can get a little bit of relief from the things they're doing. 
Also today, I want to point out that uh, we've hit an important milestone. Uh, a, a while back, uh, Governor Justice called me to the office and said, hey, uh, I want you to take the lead and the guard to help uh, commerce to get our RISE program and our 2016 flood recovery program on track. Uh, today, I want to uh, point out that we have hit a milestone where all of the houses in the RISE program are now in contract. Uh, we have hit uh, good momentum on our demolition program. Uh, we have the 21st and 22nd bridge, uh, bridges going up uh, in place. Good progress continues to be made on the Riverview project in Clendenin, although I know for a lot of people and a lot of families, the governor and I both understand that this was not as fast as it should have been initially, but we've made significant progress to move those things along. I wanna uh, particularly thank uh, Secretary Gonch and a couple employees at Commerce, uh, Jennifer uh, Farrell and uh, Michelle Tharp Penaloza, uh, as well as Bob Kales, who's a former guardsman and now uh, our uh, resiliency coordinator directly under the governor's office and Jenny Ganaway from BOAD. Uh, those four individuals made significant uh, efforts and took on significant leadership roles in helping us get this to this point. Governor, I, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to announce today that we've got all those in contract. We continue to make progress and we understand uh, that you continue to press us to make sure we get this done expeditiously and take care of our citizens. Thank you. All right, thank you, General. Uh, Dr. Ayn Amjad, our State Health Officer, and Bill Crouch, Secretary of the West Virginia DHHR, are also joining us today and are available for questions. We'll now go to questions from members of the media. The first today from Kenny Bass with WCHS and Fox 11. Hello, Governor. Hello, panelists. This is Kenny Bass with Channel 8 and Fox 11. Governor, how do you cut through the fog of weariness? How do you cut through the fog of uh, when you bang on a drum continuously, people eventually will tune you out. So I know we've heard numbers, we've heard dire predictions, we've heard uh, the winter months are gonna be terrible, we've heard, and, and I'm certain that, that statistically and medically and epidemiologically, epidemiologically, <laughs> epidemiologists say that that is all true, but how do you cut through the fog and the noise of people just tired and turning you off and doing what they're gonna do? It seems to me that's a very, big challenge that nobody across the country from the president on down has been able to crack. Thank you. Well, Kenny, it's a challenge and, and, you know, it kind of pleases me when you stumbled over that word a little bit, because, you know, I stumble all the time and, and here's a, here's a super professional that uh, stumbled a little bit today, which I, I'm glad to see because maybe that makes me feel a little bit better about stumbling all the time. But, uh, uh, but let me just say this, Kenny, I really feel very confidently about this. There's no one, there's no one that could sit in front of a camera and motivate and encourage and, and remove the frustration and the wariness and, and, and just, and just the, the tiredness that, that everybody is getting into about wearing a mask and about trying to take care and trying to be concerned and all that. But at the same time, I, I want to take one second to again thank the West Virginia people because I really believe, I really do believe this. I believe that they trust me because they know I'll tell them the truth. They know I won't inflate things and scream wolf, wolf, wolf and everything when it's not terribly bad. I know that they listen. Now, at the same time, I know that people are tired and it's frustrating and all that kind of stuff. And I know that it is impossible, impossible for me to constantly rah, rah the troops and everything and make it just perfect. It won't be, it just won't be. That's why in so many ways we're America. I mean, really and truly, Kenny, when it really gets right down to it, uh, 
We enjoy and we love our freedoms and it made us and it continues to make us great in every single way. And with that, it can be counterproductive to, to what we are trying to do when we try to get everybody moving in the right direction, everyone wearing a mask and doing all the stuff that we have to do. Kenny, I am, uh, I am confident and I am honored that I am confident in the fact that I do believe the people have really listened to me and I thank them because I know if they hadn't have listened, I know just how bad that our numbers would be. You know, West Virginia is the most elderly, the most, you know, chronic illnesses within a rock's throw of all these people that are right around us. Absolutely, Kenny, we could have had a catastrophe here beyond belief. Now, it's a catastrophe to look right down at these numbers and see 422 are dead, but that is a fraction of what it could have been if the people hadn't have listened. So I thank them and uh, sure, sure it's tough and sure it's tiring and everything to sit here and be a 350 pound cheerleader on a good day. And I mean that on a good day because there's days when that 350 pounds and the scales doesn't come back 350 pounds. But with all that being said, you know, I truly have tried to be serious and be absolutely reassuring and be and smile and, and, and laugh a little bit from the standpoint that the good Lord gave you the ability to smile and laugh. And this is tough stuff, a tough journey. So with all that, I hate to give you that long of an answer, but uh, Kenny, all I can say is sure it's tough, but, but I really appreciate what we've done and I appreciate the people listening. So uh, we're just gonna keep on trying. All right, thank you, Kenny. Next to Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to follow up a little bit on what Kenny was talking about. Some people take it more seriously than others. And if you are a person who is taking the words to heart and you're out and amongst them and you've come up upon a bunch of people without masks, should you engage them? Uh, should you try to say, hey, look, I don't want to get into a position where I think that there is mask shaming going on out there, but sh should you attack it that way? And, and kind of a follow-up on that, if I may, um, I I've gotten a, a couple of reports from folks who said, you know, I would call the authorities, the Beverage Commission, about a an establishment that is not following the protocol but I don't want to get involved to the point that I'm going to be drug into it. I, I wouldn't mind calling if it was like a crime solvers deal and I could report it anonymously, but I, I certainly don't want to get involved to the point where I'm going to be called in and make a bunch of enemies. Governor, could you address that? Paul, these are tough questions. And, uh, and you know, and I'll, I, I just say this, that, uh, you know, if you can drive upon an accident on the road and, and, and look at someone that's uh, laying over in a ditch and just go by because you don't want to get involved, then, then, you know, I don't know how to help you. You know, at the end of the day, uh, when you see somebody that's driving erratically, you know, on the road and you don't take time to call the state police or call the, your local officials and everything and say, we got to get this person off the, off the road, you know, report their license plate or whatever it may be and, and, and ask someone to come and help because you're concerned you're going to get involved. You know, uh, I know, I know the headaches of getting involved, but you know, Paul, my feelings are just as simple as this. Uh, Jim Justice didn't, doesn't need to be sitting here. And Jim Justice didn't need to, you know, step up and be your governor. But honestly, and, and Lord knows, Jim Justice doesn't deserve a lot of the airs and rocks that are thrown at him. But absolutely, Paul, I believed that I could help and to step up and serve. 
if we don't believe that way, at some point in time, we won't be America anymore. You know, it is our duty, our duty to try to do everything we can be. Now, we don't need to be a bunch of, who knows, Barney Fife's, you know, to where we're, we're challenging people and, 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 and doing things that, I mean, what I would do is if I were, if I were coming into a situation and people, you know, you could see people weren't wearing a mask, I would, I would have my mask on and say, you're endangering your own health and you're endangering others. And, and I'd surely appreciate it if you'd think about that. I'd do it in a very respectful way, you know, but, uh, but at the same time, Paul, literally, literally in this world, that's what we have done. If there's any reason to complain about America and where we are today, Paul, it is as simple as this. It doesn't matter if it's right and wrong anymore. All that matters is what we can get by with. We gotta get back to right and wrong. And so, uh, so I just step up. I just say, for crying out loud, step up. Step up, and West Virginians can do that and do that in a great way. So I understand to not get involved, but I, I don't condone it. All right, thank you, Paul. Next to Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Uh, my question is for Dr. Marsh. Uh, you said the next six to 12 weeks are kind of going to be, you know, a, a new peak, a new low point. Uh, could you drill down on this a little bit more and tell us what folks can expect to see during that time period and any advice to people for navigating it? Thank you, sir. Governor? No, please. So thank you, Charles. Um, I'm really uh, using as a reference point a couple of things when I say that. So number one is uh, Dr. Michael Osterholm of the University of Minnesota was really the first person to make predictions about a pandemic like this. So his perspective, and I've had the opportunity to speak to him, has been that things as we saw in the 1918 pandemic uh, are likely going to be worse because as the governor said, as the weather gets colder, as we get the flu, as we get inside, that, um, that that's going to um, uh, increase and amplify the person-to-person -person spread. The other thing that we're seeing, and this is from the Centers for Disease Control, is that many cases now are being spread by people who are having extended family gatherings and friend gatherings without being nearly as careful. So places where people aren't wearing masks around each other and, and coming into closer contact. Um, as we look around the country, we start to see the acceleration, as the governor pointed out, of the RT values. And again, I said 71,000 cases yesterday, first time over 70,000 in three months. And we see the death rate going up. It's averaging 800 and some over the last week, but it got over 1,000 at least one day last week. So I think that for us in West Virginia, we are not um, subject only to a fate that is not under our control, but in fact, we have power and control over what our future looks like. And I think while we know that the rest of the country in parts are gonna very much struggle during this next self, six to 12 weeks, and perhaps even beyond, depending on what a vaccine, when a vaccine comes, and what drugs we have that, that show increased ability to reduce the severity of COVID-19, but we have the power. We talked about that really early in the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I think vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis Kenny's question and Paul's question, this is our power to stop what could happen to us. And it's really very simple. We get tested. We answer the call when it comes to contact tracing so that we separate the people who can infect others from, from the people that can't. And we wear masks, wear masks, we physically distance, and we're careful about being around big crowds of people, being indoors with others, particularly if we're not wearing masks, and we're careful about who we're around. If we do that, we'll take a very, very concerning uh, look at the next six to 12 months, and we'll turn it into another episode of this pandemic where West Virginia is leading the way.
All right, thank you, Charles. Next to, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Next to Mark Curtis with Next Star Media. Uh, good afternoon, Governor and uh, Cabinet members. Uh, Governor, I want to come back, to, and I wish Bernie Dolan was here, but I want to come back to my question of the other day about athletic activities and uh, counties that may be orange for non-contact sports. I, I see there was an exemption made for cross-country because uh, they can socially distance, but has any firm decision have been made about soccer tournaments? I realize we're getting into the regional and sectional tournaments, and some teams are playing, but they're in danger of going into the orange or red, and they're wondering if they're going to be stopped down mid-tournament, or is soccer going to be con uh, called a, or classified as a non-contact sport? Mark, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, you're looking at a contact sport, and uh, and and you know, we've not made any more changes. I think the SSAC is, and and our education department are the the primary experts we need to turn to, as well as our our medical experts that are weighing in on it. But uh, we've not made any additional changes right now. All right, thank you, Mark. Next to Matthew Young with the West Virginia Daily News. Hi, good afternoon. Matthew Young with the West Virginia Daily News. The utility assistance program, uh, just for some clarification, if, if I'm understanding it correctly, those who have been deemed to be qualified or, or maybe pre-qualified, I guess is a better way to word it, they're going to receive applications in the mail directly from their utility providers. Now, um, I'm assuming the, the pre-qualification means that they are, in fact, carrying a balance from March to July. For customers that maybe don't have a balance but could also benefit from the program, is there anything in this for that can assist them, maybe uh, in the form of a bill credit or something like that? And if so, is there a, a separate application process that they would they would pursue? Or is this exclusively for the customers that are currently carrying a balance from March until July? Thank you. Okay, right now it is only for delinquent bills, but I understand, I understand exactly where you're going with this because, you know, I would concur, you know, if you've got someone that has, has, has really having a tough time and they have some way, somehow, you know, you know, scratched around and found enough money to keep their, their utility bills, you know, paid and everything. And, and they're still really, really struggling, I want to find a way to help them. You know, I mean, really, at the end of the day, this whole thing is designed for, for two purposes. One is to surely help those that are delinquent, stressed beyond belief, worried to totally to death that they're going to get their power bill cut off or their water cut off and everything, and, and, and maybe even taking money out of out of an area where they need to buy food or whatever it may be, you know, they're, they're worried to totally death, stressed beyond belief. This is designed to help them. And the backside of it is designed to help our utilities from a standpoint that they are not cutting people off and everything. And they're trying to help and be good partners and everything. We're trying to help both sides of the fence there. But you're right in the fact that we will have some that have paid their bills in some way, somehow, I, you know, I wish to goodness that we could figure out a way to back up and help them as well. And we won't quit on that. We'll keep trying to figure a way to do that. All right, thank you, Matthew. Last question today comes from Joe Severino with the Charleston Gazette Mail. Yeah, hi, uh, question for Dr. Marsh. Um, do we know what is driving these across the board increases in cases among age groups? Um, you know, how much of it is just virus fatigue versus, you know, what else do we know about it? Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. I, I think that uh, the data is telling us that, in fact, as we saw during the 1918 pandemic as well, that as this thing continues to go on, people are getting very fatigued. We also know that more people, as we've gone on, are exposed uh, to uh, those infected. And we are picking that up more as we are testing more, which is really important to be able to do. But for a lot of, of people, 
they still might be infected, they're not getting tested, and they um, may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and be able to spread to others. So that's the reason why we have to be extra thoughtful right now, as the governor said, to really, really commit, and this sounds so simple, it's almost you know mind-numbing that, that we've said it so many times, but wearing a mask and physically distancing six feet or more from other people, if everybody does it, it is equivalent to having a vaccine today. It is equivalent to having a vaccine today, and we're not doing it at the level we need to. And I'm not talking about personal rights of people. I certainly respect that, First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, all the rights that we enjoy being in this country. But you are not just protecting yourself. You are protecting all of us. You're protecting the vulnerable people the governor's talked about. You're protecting our first responders, our health care workers, our National Guard. You are protecting the state of West Virginia. And right now, people are fatigued and people aren't being as, um, as cooperative and committed to service to other people as we need to be. And I know it's hard, but that's what makes West Virginia great. And it is time to be called to serve again. And I have absolute confidence, as the, governor, as the governor does, that our people will answer this call with high distinction. All right, thank you, Joe. Governor, back to you. Okay, I'll, I'll end it up and everything. I'll end it up pretty quickly and everything. Uh, you know, today we're, we're, we've got a big announcement that's coming out about this afternoon. We've got to move a bunch of the video equipment and everything from here, and that's why we're we're maybe cutting off a little bit early and everything, but, uh, but I, I, again, I thank everybody for, for, for all their questions and all, the, all the, the feedback from our experts. I'll be really fast about this. I'll just say, you know, a special, special thanks again to our National Guard families, all those that are coming home, all those that are being deployed. We, uh, you know, just countless thanks and everything for all the great work that they're doing to give us all the freedoms that we have each and every day. The other thing I'd tell you is, you know, I'm a math guy. You know, I may not be able from time to time to remember names, but I can remember numbers and I can absolutely do the numbers. I'm a business guy, I'm a math guy. Let me tell you a formula that the great Clay Marsh, the great Dr. Clay Marsh has just given us and absolutely, it's simple as mud, West Virginia, and we cannot drop our guard. We cannot drop our guard. We had great questions today from, from Kenny and Paul and different people, you know, about, you know, what do you do when you get tired? How do you react? And the bottom line to the formula is just this, mask equal vaccine. How can it be more simple? Today we don't have a vaccine, but mask equal vaccine. Remember that, West Virginia. Absolutely, that will go a long, long way. God bless you. Thank you.